Hi, my name's Elena Gamatos and I'm a fourth generation Australian Greek born right here in Darwin. This is the story of those Greek families that travelled a very long way to settle in the Northern Territory. For thousands of years, the Greeks have migrated throughout the world, taking with them their unique culture and traditions. This is the story of those Greeks who found their way halfway around the world to settle in the tropical Northern Territory of Australia. For over a century, these Greeks have built a thriving community that has played a major role in shaping the history of this frontier region. And our history in the region is going back to the 16th century when six Greek sailors sailed with Vasco da Gama in East Timor. And then the other Greeks have started appearing here in the 18th century. The first Greek recorded in the Northern Territory was M. Kangris, a cook on George Goida's survey vessel, the Munta, in February 1869. During this expedition, the town site of Darwin was surveyed prior to establishment. Over the next 30 years, small numbers of Greek immigrants arrived in the southern colonies. Most were transient sailors or single labourers seeking their fortune in a wealthy land. With oppressive heat, monsoonal floods and hot dry winters, the first Europeans developed small settlements, outposts dotted along a vast coastline. By the 1870s, the overland telegraph line between Adelaide and Darwin had been forged through the centre of Australia's most demanding landscape. The port of Darwin grew, contending with eight metre tides and hostile wet seasons. The wharf became an important centre for the delivery of stores, mail and passengers, as well as the export of cattle. At the time of Federation in 1901, there were about 4,000 Greeks in the new nation of Australia. Political turmoil in Asia Minor shortly after 1910 led to many Greeks from the Dodecanese Islands, including Castellorizo, to leave their homeland as economic refugees. In less than a decade, approximately 7,000 of the 19,000 original Castellorisians migrated south to Australia. By this time, Darwin was a small but thriving town, with the majority of the population being Chinese and Aboriginal, with a small number of white European masters. The living conditions in the tropical climate were harsh for the Europeans, and migrant labour was seen as necessary to build the territory. The Chinese had begun arriving in the top end from the 1880s during the gold rush and had established a thriving community in Darwin with market gardens and a shanty town in Kavanagh Street. In 1911, the Commonwealth took control of the territory and began enforcing the White Australia policy in earnest. The government had offered incentives to Greek immigrants to migrate to Darwin to replace the Chinese workforce which was to be officially discouraged in the interests of a white Australia. The first wave of Greek migrants came to Darwin in 1913, hearing about a labour shortage and high wages. They found harsh conditions, but at the same time, opportunity. The majority of the migrants were single men, with their sweethearts in other cities or in their homeland on the other side of the world. Earnings were often sent home to support their families. World War I commenced in 1914, as did the construction of the large Vestes Meatworks in Darwin, which attracted Greek workers in the building program and then as general labourers in the abattoirs. Wartime labour shortages became critical and the Commonwealth Government directed immigrant manpower northward to development projects, which were seen as important for the national interest. From 1915, many Greeks worked on the construction of the Pine Creek to Darwin Railway, a vital link to this inaccessible gold mining town. In Darwin, there were two Greek areas at the time. The seamen lived in a shanty Greek town near Doctor's Gully. The others lived in Salonika, near the rail link to the meatworks, where the Botanic Gardens nursery stands today. 
Coming to Darwin also, we find out some of the original history and, to my surprise, some of the names like Salonika Crossing. And when I go back and look at Salonika Crossing, it's because a lot of Macedonian men came and set camp in the area. And of course, come from Macedonia, what else will call it, but something to remind the country, Thessaloniki or Salonika. Um, a church in which to worship was needed in accordance with maintaining their strong orthodox customs. A small corrugated iron church was erected near the Greek town. Now that was built out of timber that was collected from the 11 mile and bought in timber and galvanized iron. And that was a church. And also around that church there was humpies as well where a lot of uh, Greek people lived that had no homes. In 1917, the first recognised Greek community was formed and a small rudimentary Orthodox church was built at Salonika. The first visiting Orthodox priest, Father Chrysanthos, came to Darwin from Perth to perform the first true Greek wedding, a double wedding, for the Haritos family. Until then, Weddings were usually performed by Anglican ministers in the town hall or at the Anglican church, who tried their best to speak some Greek so the bride and groom might understand their vows. One of the first recorded births of a Greek Australian took place under a mango tree in Darwin in 1918. In 1919, Estratias Haritos, John Svakinakis and Dick Kolivas established a salt works which supplied the meatworks as well as local buffalo shooters and pastoralists. Between 1914 and 1919, an estimated 1,400 Greeks lived in Darwin. However, by the 20s, with many construction works completed and the sudden closure of the meatworks, most of the Greek workers had left Darwin to find work in the Kimberleys in Queensland or further south. The census of 1921 shows there were only 67 Greek adults remaining in Darwin. They established themselves through the 20s and 30s in various endeavours. I was born here on the 27th of June, 1921. My family first migrated uh, to, well, to Perth, and my father found his way up here to Wim Creek, worked up in the mines in Wim Creek, and then found his way to Darwin. So since then, the family has been here. Our families used to get get-togethers. There was never a house in Darwin that never had a get-together of a night time. It was just unknown. And furthermore, I mean, if someone wanted to build a house, OK, all he had to do was buy the materials. And everybody donated their labour free of charge. He had his house up within three or four days. This is how the community worked in those days. I mean, there was no such thing as rivalry or anything at all. I mean, we were just one happy family. That's just the way it was. We had no water. We had to rely on the old wells, you know, winding them up in the windlasses and things like that. Uh, uh, there was a couple of baker houses around the place, but the majority of the old Kessalorian uh, old ladies used to bake their own bread. And when they baked their bread was, I mean, they just didn't bake half a dozen loaves. They baked sufficient, I mean, for all the families around the place and donated it. So, and the ovens, to be quite frank with you and truthfully, the ovens were made out of anthills. Now, most of the Greek families here in Darwin, I mean, survived by growing their own vegetables, having their goats, and also having their chickens. The Kiriakou brothers opened the cafe Zero in the Tropics in Kavanagh Street, bringing ice cream and frozen delights to the township. He was the first one, actually, that uh, bought and sold Peter's ice cream here in Darwin. Darwin boomed in the mid-30s. Some of the Greeks who had left had returned to join their friends and families who had stayed. The Canaris family operated the Great Northern Cafe, but Greek delicacies were not on the menu. Michael Paspalis arrived in Darwin from Broome in 1927. Well, Michael arrived here in Darwin, I mean, and got a job with Holmes' estate. I mean, and his job was delivering ice and meat, I mean, to outlying area, well, to the whole of Darwin area. Michael lent his hand to many enterprises and soon began forging his business empire. In 1935, he travelled to Perth and returned soon after with his new bride, Chrissy Kalis. In later years, when he married Chrissy, uh, that was when he developed the uh, Rendezvous Cafe. Next door, of course, was Rosalind, Rosalind Court. Uh, that was controlled by Nick, his brother. Uh, that was a billiard table, of course. Uh, then, might I say, that was also bloody gambling then. <laughs> yeah. 1937 saw the arrival from Melbourne of the first Kalimnian Greek, Petros Mihailou, 
He, he was the first one here. This was without his family, of course, but I mean, he mingled, I mean, with the, uh, and was part, part of the family. A memorial to Mr. Mahalu now stands in the Kalimnin Hall. Throughout the 30s, Darwin's population grew steadily, with about 10% being of Greek heritage. Greeks were now becoming respected business people in the community, performing functions not normally associated with immigrants in other parts of Australia. By the early 1940s, the military build-up led to improved facilities and public infrastructure. Greeks participated in the construction of the new facilities, preparing Darwin for the defence of Australia from the Japanese. Louis Hamanis led many teams of Greek construction workers, contributing to the building of the Roper River, Daly River and Borolula police stations, as well as hospitals and many other public buildings in these small and developing townships. DMF started moving into Darwin. That was the Darwin Mobile Force. They started moving into Darwin in 1938. Uh, the gun emplacements and everything were going in there. Narakia was built up, but I mean, we didn't have the manpower here. And then they started uh, Winelli as well. Uh, Sydney William Huss going up into Winelli. With the uncertainty of war, the civilian population was evacuated. Most travelled to southern cities. And the early warning after the bombing of Pearl Harbour, Darwin was evacuated and we were evacuated out on the 26th of December on the SS Coolinda. And the families uh, with the young ones were evacuated. So it only left the old people here that wanted to stay, right? They had the choice to move out if they wanted to, but they stayed. My father stayed. The bombing of Darwin by the Japanese began on the 19th of February 1942, killing 237 people. The raids continued. Darwin suffered over 60 bombing raids during the war and was all but destroyed. We saw all these planes coming up and people were saying, oh, he's uh, the American. I said, to hell they are. I said, get the hell out of here, which we did. Uh, went for cover, but that was it. It was chaos after that. The devastation was terrific, you know, so, I mean, it was all hands on deck. I mean, trying to get survivors out of that burning, burning water. I mean, Darwin Harbour was just a blaze. I mean, it was just, uh, just one sheet of flame. And trying to get survivors out of there, I mean, and some of the survivors, I mean, that you did pull out who were still alive, I mean, the minute you touched them, I mean, their flesh just peel straight off them. Um, desertion and panic. And there was panic. You have no idea the panic is, that was created after the bombing of Darwin. And this is by army personnel who were trained. You couldn't walk down the street unless you were yelling out, friend or foe. I mean, this is how bad it was. And nighttime in particular, the 303s were just going off right left and bloody sideways. Darwin had become a war zone and was occupied by troops, with only very few civilians required to support the war effort. I was posted back to Larrakia in 1946. So there was nothing here then, but at Larrakia we were okay. We had accommodation at Larrakia, and uh, so we were okay. But then uh, people started drifting back, but they had to have authority to come back. At the end of the war, the Greeks were quick to return to the devastated city and commenced rebuilding their businesses and homes, which were ravaged by the bombing and looting. In 1946, Michael Paspalis returned from Sydney with his family. They ran and then bought the Hotel Darwin, which was to become the centrepiece of Darwin social society, certainly a place to be seen. They used to have a dance a band there every Saturday night, so everybody used to get dressed up and um, go to the Hotel Darwin to enjoy the, uh, the atmosphere, the dancing. At the time, Theo and I both worked at the Hotel Darwin. We worked for our, our uncle, Mick Paspalis. And we did all kinds of odd jobs. We worked in the bar, you know, we were waiters. We used to do the early morning uh, call crews because all the airline crews used to stay at the Hotel Darwin in those days. Well, I married Tom Seidenboss, got married in the Catholic Church and my w wedding was the first one to be at the Hotel Darwin in the green room and we had uh, people sitting in the green room and out in the garden and it was really a beautiful wedding. The Palais de Dance was the meeting place of all the teenagers because of the bands and the dance floor. Prior to the war, 
that used to be a tennis court and it was converted into a dance hall. And that was where all the teenagers congregated, danced. They had music, they had everything there. They weren't allowed in the Hotel Darwin where they were allowed at the Catholic Church. Michael's brother Nicholas also returned to Darwin at this time with his Australian wife, Vivian. Nicholas Paspalis, who changed his name to Paspali, had been a master pearler before the war and soon restarted his pearling business. Paspali Pearling Company would go on to become the largest producer of South Sea pearls in the world. He was a pearler in Cossack and then he appeared in Pohedland and he was pearling again and there where he found one of the biggest pearls ever found in the area that in 1920s or 30s I think it was worth about 400 pounds was an enormous amount of money those days. In 1949, Les Liveris, the first Darwin-born Greek to join the public service, was made head of local immigration. He encouraged many Greeks and Europeans to migrate to Darwin. Over the years, Mr. Liveris became highly regarded in Darwin, Spain and Greece and assisted many families in bringing their relatives to Australia. And Les did a, a fantastic job. I mean, um, later on in years, uh, when he was posted overseas to Spain, in getting a lot of these Greek people who are here today. It was very difficult. They were going to be a good person. Then they were going to be a Hellenist. Then they were going to be a Hellenist. Δεν είχαμε τίποτα δεν είχαμε. Μέσα στρατιωτικά κρεβάτια τσιμόμεδα με μια κουνουπιέρα τα ρούχα μας τα βράζαμε μέσα σε ένα καζάνι για να τα πλύνουμε. Περάσαμε πολύ δύσκολες μέρες. Πολύ δύσκολες μέρες. Πάρα πολύ. Και τώρα στο τάμα. Τώρα, τώρα είμαστε ό,τι πρέπει. Τώρα είμαστε ό,τι πρέπει. Όλα μας τα έχουμε. Δεν μας λύβγεται τίποτα. Τίποτα. Also in 1949, the first Greek Cypriots arrived with names such as Sirimi, Patsulu, and Christodoulou. In the early 1950s, many single Greek men, mostly post-war economic refugees, made their way to Darwin to live and work, staying in simple workers' quarters. From Kalimnos was only Mikhailos and a few other people, and, uh, and we was uh, around about 20, 25 uh, fellas with no families up here. My family goes in Greece. After, after a few years, I bring them everybody up here free. Free because I come and free by government. In the mid-50s, Darwin was a very, very small place. You had the city of Darwin, which is the boundaries of, you know, Wood Street, McMinn Street, Cavanagh Street, Smith Street, and uh, the Esplanade. And then you had Daly Street, and then you had a few little houses up here at Larrakia. Uh, there was nothing out at Fanny Bay in those days, very little. Uh, and of course, there was no development out at Nycliffe. And in fact, um, Bagot Road, in the late, even up to the late 50s, was still a, a single road gravel road all the way up to Nycliffe. Skewer Park was plenty of mosquitoes and plenty of sand flies. And, uh, I tell you, it was nice. I love the Stuart Cup because I've been there for, for, for 38, four years. I love the, this place very much. The Belson camp near the Catholic Church was home to many. The earlier Greek settlers helped these new arrivals with language and literacy skills as well as job opportunities. Greeks made their mark on post-war business in the top end. Popular businesses were established, such as the Star Milk Bar in Smith Street, the Rendezvous Café, the Fortiadas Delicatessen, and Helena's Fashion, which was the first high fashion store in Darwin. It, the coffee shop was sort of um, little tables, and he used to do all these American pancakes, and Estelle would come in at 11 o'clock and do all her belly dancing, and it was really a good atmosphere. I can still see Theo with the big fat pancakes, <laughs> and everybody there doing the belly dancing with Estelle. <laughs> Early beginnings working in the restaurant, it was basically um, very English with the roast on the weekends and the cold salads. So you had a three course, good meal, three course meal. Later on, we started with these uh, with the stews, but they 
the mic was requesting, so we had to change the menu. Spaghetti. Yes, and the spaghetti <laughs> came into the picture. When I first started, I couldn't offer an olive. I couldn't offer yeah. a salami. People would just turn their nose up. There was no way that they would try salami or they'd have an olive. The milk bar was excellent. We had a delightful milk bar. We had to make our own drinks, our own cordials. And that was the kind of life that um, people used to congregate around a milk bar more than a hotel. Everybody used to come there after the movies or whatever. They knew that the, um, the coffee shop, the, like the Bermuda coffee shop was open till four o'clock in the morning. There was only the Star Theatre. So my father started showing films at the town hall and um, then Pratt Theatre was built. And at that time there wasn't a roof, so there was only a half a roof. So we all tried to get a seat where we, if it rained we wouldn't get wet. And then the drive-in, Uncle Mick built the drive-in. And the men from the wharf would also come and they would be the first sit-in. And then you'd get the government workers would come from one o'clock onwards. Uh, then there was Rum Jungle was operating at the time and you'd get a lot of the busloads would come in from Bachelor. The movies, the movies had three sittings during the week and sometimes we have two viewings of a night. So it was always busy at interval. We'd, we'd work too late and the milk bar, the cafe would close, but the milk bar would stay we open. We knew each other by names. When we walk in the, in the mall, it wasn't a mall. There was the Star Theatre. And we met each other and the Cafe Neo. There was easy life, you know. The 1950s saw many marriages between the children of the first Greek arrivals. Marriages were often between couples of the same regional descent, strengthening bonds and family ties, customs and culture. I met my wife while I was working in her parents' restaurant. <laughs> in 1952, two Kalimnian diving teams arrived in Australia with their passage and expenses paid by the Australian government. Um, the Kalimnia is traditional of divers, sponge divers, since time immemorial, and uh, they were very, very good divers. But what happened in the 50s, a uh, disease decimated the, the sponges in the, in the region, and a lot of people were left out of work. And uh, at that time, George Johnston and Charmaine Clifton, they were in Kalimnos, and uh, they're describing the atmosphere in the island when uh, the news came that the Australian government was going to get 10 or 12 Kalimnias to bring to Australia. They had a big party, they all got drunk because they could see now a bright future coming up. The people could do what they wanted to do, what they liked to do, what they was the profession, but they would come to Australia. And people thought, well, if they come to Australia, then they can actually bring some more of their family. One team was dispatched to Broome, the other to Darwin to work on luggers operated by the Haritos family. Alas, the project was a failure. Despite their skills and another team arriving in 1954, the Kalimnian divers were unaccustomed to the treacherous seas of tropical Australia. With the unnerving death of one of the men, the experiment was over. Some sought labouring and construction work, others took on survey work between Darwin and Thursday Island. In 1953, after much fundraising, the Greek Orthodox community laid the foundations for a permanent Greek church in Darwin. Over the next few years, much effort was put into more fundraising for the construction. Picnic days at Rapid Creek were popular social occasions. A visiting archbishop officially blessed the Greek Orthodox Church of St. Nicholas, named after the patron saint of the sea. The church at the corner of Kavanagh and Daly Street still stands today. Finally, the Greeks had their own church in which to worship. Well, we were married in the Greek, the Greek church, church, although it wasn't finished. There was the framework was there, and the, the um, Church of England priest would come over, and he spoke a little bit of Greek. 1956 saw the arrival of the first permanent Greek Orthodox priest. The priest was Father Kumpis. He didn't stay long. The weather wasn't, the weather wasn't right. In the middle of the decade, the Cypriot Pantazas family established the Parap Fruit and Vegetables, which would later become Parap Fine Foods, a landmark delicatessen in Darwin, which now imports fine foods and exports local delicacies around the world. I had to go myself, and 
get my own fruit and veg, pack it myself and sell it myself. The late 50s saw many more families arriving from more ravaged Kalimnos, assisted by established Greeks, particularly their fellow Kalimnians. As a young man, the early Greeks were mostly with the Kashkarizian Greeks, mixed with some Kalimnian Greeks. And it wasn't until the early 1960s where the Cypriot Greeks started to really move into Darwin as a force. And I suppose the population always ran, I think, if the, 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 the European population was four and a half or five thousand people, there was always between 10 and 15 percent of the population were always Greek. And they played a very, very predominant role in the development of Darwin and the Northern Territory through their business enterprise, their prosperity, their hard work, and also their skills. It was the Kalimians that brought the building and the trade skills. It was the Castle Regions that brought the, the enterprise skills. Uh, and it was the, the Cypriots that brought the other technical skills uh, to the territory, which obviously were very important as Darwin was going to grow. You needed a skilled workforce. And I think the Greek community provided that workforce as well as the political and business now to get things done. So from the, you know, the early mid 50s to the early 70s, you know, the population grew by 40,000 people. My father arrived in Darwin in 1957 for a contract of six months. He was a carpenter by, by um, in background and had a six month contract here. 12 months uh, after, um, my mother followed up with the children and we've lived here ever since. Bringing with them their love of soccer, Greek teams were established by the middle of the decade. The Hellenics Club, starting with 30 children and young men. Uh, I remember stories about the Greeks setting up the soccer club and the best goalie was an Aboriginal guy who was living in, in um, uh, Bagot. And they used to pick him up every Saturday afternoon and play soccer. And of course if they win they had a party, but you were not allowed to give alcohol to the Aborigines, it was illegal. So what they were doing, they were going, having a barbecue, cooking the food, taking them inside the house, close all the windows and give their colleague alcohol like the rest of them. In 1959, the Kalimnian Brotherhood was established. Founded by Alexi Alexou, this social club allowed Greek men and their families to gather together and keep up their traditions. Darwin had changed dramatically during the 1950s. Its population had grown and the frontier township was transformed into a more ordered and urbane town. Bolstered by new immigrants and the growing number of second-generation Greek Australians, the Greek population had expanded considerably. However, the pressures of maintaining strong traditions and Greek culture in a foreign land remained. Like other European migrants, the Greeks were still regarded as new Australians and were often seen as foreign by the rest of the population. In the 60s, the government once again decided to build up Darwin as a defence post. The growth in the population and town facilities created a greater demand for more construction workers. Greek developers were making their mark on Darwin and provided newcomers with employment, skills and literary assistance. These Greek developers and construction teams earned a reputation as smart business people and hard workers and were seen on many construction sites. In 1968, a new soccer team was formed, a bit of competition for the established teams. And one day, uh, someone from Darwin, uh, John Katapodis, happened to be in Sydney and at the Panhellenic Soccer Club and he was looking for soccer players which they were interested to come to Darwin to play soccer for a year or two. So I looked at Alki and I said to him, how about we go to Darwin, there is nothing to do here. He said, well, why not? And that's how we ended up in Darwin. Fundraising created the building of a large hall, a much needed space for the many weddings and functions, and also a place for the new Greek school where the growing population of Darwin-born Greeks could learn to read and write their inherited language. The Greek Orthodox Hall, next to the St Nicholas Church in Kavanaugh Street, was opened in 1969. The 70s began in Darwin with great optimism. The population had grown to 45,000. Darwin was growing at a rapid rate. Prospects for the future were bright. Manolis Developments announced a large shopping centre was to be built on the edge of the Darwin's northern suburbs, bringing department stores, an air-conditioned mall 
and an 800-seat theatre to the people, boosting housing development in the northern suburbs and decentralising Darwin's commerce and retail areas. On Christmas Eve 1974, many of the Greek families were together, participating in religious ceremonies and celebrations. Cyclone Tracy approached, but the town was totally unprepared for the utter devastation inflicted by the cyclone overnight. So we've been through warnings and, and uh, you know, uh, on radio, but we didn't take care of it uh, as a sort of a strong uh, uh, warning of cyclone till that night, uh, about two o'clock in the morning uh, after midnight. Uh, was the wind was really unreal. Uh, as we were in the bathroom, the main hall fly, and we could see the sky. <laughs> Uh, there was, uh, the cyclone was uh, a very bad experience. We were stuck each other in one room um, till morning time. Uh, the kids was uh, locked into wardrobe uh, for safe and uh, the grandfather of the kids and me, my sister and my brother-in-law, we, we take uh, three mattresses and we just make it as a sort of a uh, uh, sort of a cage and we meet under there the house, elevator house was sort of a shaking uh, till about 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning I opened all the doors the door of the bedroom and I saw the rest of the house was flat and I thought, now what happened to our house? I thought it was only our house when I walked across the passageway and I saw around uh, I was really shocked you know, what I and saw. Uh, at about 4.30 in the morning, I heard people screaming around the back, and uh, I couldn't stay inside anymore. So I tried to get out, but it was iron and timber and everything was flying all over the places. But at the same time, I could hear that lady crying up on top of the house. The house next door, the whole roof went, everything went. It was only the floorboards left. So I managed to go over there. I was holding a piece of... Um, of vine on my side, so everything was hit in the eye and bouncing off. I went next door, I went upstairs, and it was the husband, uh, a young kid, and his wife holding off the plumbing, because that's the only thing that was left on the floorboards, just the plumbing, nothing else. Uh, the next day, uh, we saw uh, Jumbo Quandas fl uh, flying, uh, flying around uh, Darwin, Try to find out where to land. So we, will, we all went to the airport and the police there sent us into the railway to try to clean up the railway and move things from the, from the strip so the jumbo can land. So we did that. Um, we spent about an hour trying to clean up the, the, the mess of the, of the strip, we about, oh, about 40 of us. Um, and then the, the, the plane land and it was full of uh, cameras, reporters, and, and media. We uh, lost both of the supermarkets. We've lost uh, a couple of the houses. And uh, we had to be evacuated out of Darwin. The family went out first on a, on a jet. And then us men couldn't go because the men had to stay behind to clean up. And the month before the cyclone, the house went, it was finished, complete, everything brand new inside. Cyclone Tracy come, everything went down. <laughs> About the houses and the buildings, well, you can't do anything, anything, you see, just <laughs> happens, happens, the God, <laughs> you can't stop the, the, the God. The first years, the, the court was very strict, but eventually, they forget about uh, the danger. And of course, the house is still strong, but not as strong as when uh, 1975, you know, and a uh, few years after that. But after that, we start hard work. We are working very hard to fix it up. Anything has been bagged from the cycle. I never get anything. I never get anything, $5,000 only, but it was my fortune. 
after Cyclone Tracy, obviously there was a very, very massive building program. The Greeks played a very, very important role in that. Uh, but most of the major contracts went to southern companies in those days because the Reconstruction Commission, when they were letting off housing contracts, were letting them off, you know, two and four hundred at the time. And uh, you know, I think that the Greek tradesmen were picked up in those contracts as subcontractors in the reconstruction of Darwin. 68 people died. Thousands of buildings were damaged or destroyed. Again, Darwin was all but wiped off the face of the earth as in the war, becoming the only Australian city to be destroyed twice. Many women and children were evacuated to southern states. Ships in the harbour housed evacuees and workers. The clean-up began, and essential services were eventually restored. Fundraising nights were held to keep spirits high during the long and arduous reconstruction. The Greeks had become influential in the construction industry, and there was plenty of work for all. Names such as Halikos, Malatos, Liverus, Alkidas, Pastrikos, Musellus, Samakos, Makrilos and Tamatsos were heavily involved in the reconstruction effort. Rebuilding took some years and as housing became available most evacuees eventually returned. However, some never did. The 70s saw another wave of migration and more integration. War broke out in Cyprus in 1974, leading to many Cypriots escaping to Australia. The Macedonian Greeks formed their own association in 1976 to preserve and maintain Greek Macedonian culture. The Macedonians became involved with Darwin schools, offering the Greek language to students. They also performed fundraising activities for various charities, receiving a special award from Ethnic Affairs for contributions for the disabled. The Bougainvillea Festival, known today as the Festival of Darwin, was Darwin's premier annual event. The various Greek communities would each enter a float in the main parade to give the young an opportunity to be proud of their heritage. 1974 saw Nick Donders from one of Darwin's long-established Castellaresian families enter politics. I was approached by the country Liberal Party in those days uh, to see whether I would uh, be interested in standing as a candidate for the first Northern Territory Legislative Assembly elections. The Northern Territory was granted self-government in 1978 and Donders soon became a minister, holding ten portfolios during his political life. I became the first minister for youth, sport and recreation and I shared a portfolio of community development. As the Minister for Sport, his goal was to improve sporting facilities throughout the Territory. His achievement now sees many great sporting events held in the Territory each year. But the highlights of that career was, you know, people talk about Marara, Marara Sporting Complex. And today I go out there and if they've got an official football function on or something is, they always refer to me as the father of Marara. And that's something that I'm very proud of. With a political career spanning 20 years, including terms as a federal member for the Northern Territory, he is proud to be one of the first Australian politicians from a Greek background. The 80s arrived, and Darwin's Greek community grew stronger and wealthier, enabling many improvements to their community and expansion of their business empires. Manolis Development started construction of the $3 million Sheraton Hotel in Mitchell Street. The Paspali family suffered the loss of Nicholas Paspali, in 1984, with his son, also Nicholas, then taking the Paspali Pearling Company into the future. By the end of the decade, the Paspali family had offices in New York and Hong Kong and accounted for 80% of the South Sea pearls produced in Australia. The Paspalis family developed Centrepoint and the Galleria, both landmarks within the rapidly growing CBD. By this stage, the Paspalis group under the control of Chrissy Paspalis, held a large portfolio of property developments and business in the Northern Territory and around Australia. In the sporting arena, Darwin's Greek golden boy boxer, Kalimnian John Cerritos, would win numerous Australian boxing titles. Known as the 32nd champ, he achieved hero status in Darwin and was well known throughout Australia. Greek community projects flourished in the 1980s. 
construction of a Greek school was commenced in 1984 on land adjoining the Greek Community Hall in Nightcliffe. The Greek school had humble beginnings. I remember we were here by Konstantin Mandriti, who, under the house of the Hierarch today, there we were together with the Archie Dalinopoulos and we were able to do English lessons. And I remember I was one of the good teachers. From there we learned a lot of things in the English language. The school offered Greek parents a chance for their children to learn their native tongue and culture and participate in events. Today, more than 200 students attend Saturday morning language classes. More fundraising in the community led to the Orthodox Church in Kavanagh Street receiving a facelift. The original exterior was replaced with brick, taking on a more tropical style, though still retaining a traditional Greek Orthodox look. The inaugural Glen Tea that was held at the Greek school in 1988 for the bicentennial, they actually hosted a, an Australian citizenship ceremony, which is really a first and I think an only for the territory where the Minister for Immigration gave special delegation to a member of the Hellenic Macedonian Association to actually confer citizenship. Proving extremely popular, the Glen Tea Festival outgrew its venue and evolved into a cultural event attended by many Darwin residents. Each year on the Esplanade, the whole city of Darwin joins with the Greek community to celebrate Greek heritage, traditions, music, food and dance. Held early in June each year, it is a calendar event not to be missed and is a popular tourist attraction. A Glenty magazine is produced, trumpeting advances in the community and providing important historical information, not to mention the social pages. The 1990s saw many Greeks succeeding in many fields and contributing greatly to Darwin's economic and social development. These second, third and fourth generation Greek Australians follow proudly in their parents' footsteps, rarely forgetting their heritage and culture or the struggle of their forefathers as they forged ahead in the wild frontier of Northern Australia. The strength of the community has been held together by its traditions and faith with the church playing a major role. Easter is the one time of year all the Greek communities come together in celebration of the resurrection of Christ. On Easter weekend, thousands of Greeks congregate in Darwin to celebrate their culture, traditions and faith. Many preparations are made for the culmination of celebrations on Easter Sunday, with the midnight mass on the eve of Easter Sunday often proving to be an explosive event. The last decade has seen Greeks come to the forefront in the territory. In 2001, Greek-born John Anictonatus was appointed as the administrator of the Northern Territory. A child immigrant, Anictonatus was a successful businessman and community leader and epitomizes the transformation of the position of Greeks in the territory over the last century. The Greek community of the territory can now reflect on how they took part in a great challenge. Uh, and actually the real Greeks are the Greeks that live outside Greece, in Australia and America. These are the ones that remember the dialect of their village. These are the ones that remember their customs. These are the ones actually they still sing and dance the old traditional Greek songs. With the growth of the Greek community, it's enabled also my grandchildren and also my own children to be part of the community. <laughs> that will know is, is something unbelievable, beautiful. The presence of Greeks in the tropical north of Australia shows the adventure spirit. Differences in the cultures tend to not be differences but similarities. People find ways that they enjoy living together and I think that's obvious anywhere you go in Darwin. Well, after 50 years I feel Australian but uh, I, I still uh, a Cypriot. We've laid a foundation for the um, oncoming generations hopefully. So it's up to the young people now to carry on. <laughs> I'm proud to be Greek and I'm proud to be Territorian. We've only just scratched the surface of the history of Greeks in the Territory. So the next time you hear someone speaking Greek, why don't you ask them their story? My name's Elena Gamatas. Yassas!
Δώσ' μου ένα παιδί να εξομολογηθώ